The second example in the book of Genesis that sheds a great deal of light on where the rulers of this world claim their authority is in Genesis chapter 6, which describes the Nephilim, a word that roughly translates to giants from Hebrew. Verse 4 of this chapter reads, quote, There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown, unquote. What this describes is angels having children with women, who would go on to become great beings. Some say that the Goliath that David defeated with a sling was one of the Nephilim. And what's particularly interesting about this is how it relates to the many claims about giant skeletons being discovered, only to disappear later on. It's strange to think that angels would come to earth and have children with women because angels are generally considered above human desire. However, there are other beings that could be described as angels, albeit fallen ones. The angels that fought in the war in heaven against God, only to be cast down to earth, were led by none other than Lucifer, who many describe as being renamed Satan. The trouble is that the Bible doesn't go into great detail about the angels that had children with women, and this doesn't reflect the character of angels in the rest of the Bible. With this in mind, let's explore the possibility that the rulers of this world believe their authority stems from a bloodline of the fallen. Whatever we say about the rulers of this world, they believe that their legitimacy comes from a particular hereditary bloodline. And this isn't unusual when you look into how rulers have preserved their wealth and power historically. In the past, this was monarchies and aristocracies that intermarried for centuries, creating close-knit circles that preserved status. This has generally been considered a divine right to rule, whether it's someone being the living embodiment of a deity or direct authority that comes from God. We see this in the Bible with the kings of Israel. Some miss the fact that it was perfectly acceptable for people to pray and bow down to these kings since they represented God's authority. We see this in 1 Chronicles 29.20, where people bowed down and prayed to King David in the verse that reads, quote, And all the congregation blessed the Lord God of their fathers, and bowed down and worshipped the Lord and the King. Unquote. In a secular world of elected politicians, we're led to believe that spiritual authority has ended, but this isn't necessarily true. The masses have been taken further away from the spiritual discernment necessary to understand how this works today by being fed a steady diet of atheism and pseudo-spirituality. But when we look closer at the world around us, it's easier to see that there are so many ritualistic traditions and beliefs that people still unconsciously adhere to. And I could spend hours purely addressing this, especially in relation to occult symbolism. What secularism has allowed the current rulers of this world to do is co-opt spiritual authority, in some part by hiding behind Christianity. Ultimately, however, the rulers of this world still consider their authority to come from a source that isn't granted by men or indeed women. Rather, this comes from a bloodline that stems from those directly opposed to the authority of the God described in the Bible. It's interesting that even spiritual or secular-minded people are beginning to realize that, whether or not the devil exists, the elite are preoccupied with adhering to satanic traditions that I can't really get into in such a censored internet environment. The Bible repeatedly describes how Satan is the ruler of this world, which is one example of how understanding the Bible can reveal a lot about where we currently find ourselves. One biblical passage that indicates this is John 12, 31, which reads, quote, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out, unquote. Another is 2 Corinthians 4, 4, which reads, quote, 
In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers, unquote. If you put the context of these and other biblical passages together that talk about the ruler, prince or God of this world, it tells us that Satan has authority over the world, at least in the current era we're living in. So is it possible that the rulers of this world believe their authority comes from Satan in a similar vein to the ancient kings of Israel taking their authority from God? Personally speaking, I would say that all the evidence indicates that this is the case when you look closer at the ritualistic practices, traditions and symbolism associated with people and organisations that will not be named in this video. So how is this authority established? The answer lies in several other parts of the Bible that go a long way to explaining the traditions associated with the elite circles these people are part of. Two parts of the Bible, both found in the book of Genesis, explain how we have two separate traditions that stem from either God or Satan. The first is the story of Cain and Abel, where Cain murders his brother Abel because he was jealous of his prosperity. God then puts a mark on Cain and his descendants become known as the first city builders. Bear in mind that historically Mesopotamia is considered the earliest city-based civilization, also the origin of Babylonian culture and esoteric traditions that are still kept alive today through secret societies and occultism. Mesopotamia is an exceedingly fertile plain situated between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. For five millennia, this small strip of land situated in what is today Iraq, Kuwait, and Syria fostered innovations that would change the world forever. Inhabited for nearly 12,000 years, Mesopotamia's stable climate, rich soil, and steady supply of fresh water made it ideal for agriculture to develop and thrive. About 6,000 years ago, seemingly overnight, some of these agricultural settlements blossomed into some of the world's first cities. In the period between 4,000 and 3,100 BC, Mesopotamia was dotted with a constellation of competing city-states. At one point, they were unified under the Akkadian Empire and then broke apart, forming the empires of Assyria and Babylon. Despite near-constant warfare, innovation and development thrived in ancient Mesopotamia. They built on a monumental scale, from palaces to ziggurats. Mammoth temples served as ritual locations to commune with the gods. However, there is one very famous book that goes into greater detail about these angels, the Book of Enoch. This book isn't considered official biblical canon by most denominations because it only takes the smallest discrepancy to cast doubt on whether a book is divinely inspired. And in this instance, the Nephilim are described as being hundreds of feet tall. But if you set this aside and focus on what else the book reads, it provides a fascinating description about the corruption of humanity due to fallen angels. An entire section of the Book of Enoch, called the Book of the Watchers, is dedicated to describing how these fallen angels corrupt humanity by teaching things like enchantments, the creation of weapons and armour, fornication, and other worldly knowledge like alchemy and astrology. Later in the book, God sends other angels to punish the fallen angels for their actions, also sending an angel to warn Noah of the Great Flood that will wash away the corruption of humanity. What's particularly interesting about the Book of Enoch is how much context it gives the Great Flood narrative, making a lot more sense of what God was trying to achieve. Another interesting revelation comes from the fact that the name given to the Nephilim in the Book of Enoch is Anakim, or Anak. This name is similar to Anunnaki, a group of deities worshipped in the ancient world, including Mesopotamia and Babylon, that I've already mentioned. When you put all this together, we start to build a picture of a bloodline that the rulers of this world preserve within their ritualistic beliefs and practices.